Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Energy Community Secretary speaking. My name is Adam Balog, and here we have also Peter Pozgai with me. It's 14 o'clock, and CET, uh, hence I, I unmuted myself and would like to kick off the meeting. We have currently 45 participants, but it's still counting. Also, we experienced it last week and the week before. So we might wait 30 seconds if, if that's fine. Um, last week we reached at the beginning around 100. So maybe it worth to wait a couple of more seconds. In the meanwhile, let me thank you again for joining us, for our uh, recurring viewers, of course, also for our speakers. This is the third and with that final session of the Acer Energy Community Joint Hydrogen Technologies Markets Regulation Pan-European Cooperation Webinar Series. And uh, opening speech will be delivered by Mr. Dennis Hesseling, who is the head of gas department in Acer. And with that, slowly, I give you the floor, Dennis. It's 14.01. Uh, participants are still coming, but they can still join, of course. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for handing over and uh, welcome to you all. Uh, indeed, my name is Dennis Hessling. I work for Acer as head of the gas department. And it's my pleasure here to welcome you to the third and final of the webinar series on hydrogen organized jointly by the Energy Community Secretariat and by Acer. Um, we're very happy, Adam already mentioned some numbers. We had on average about 150 participants to each of the two previous webinars, which I think indicates a really nice and good interest uh, across Europe uh, on these forward-looking topic of um, hydrogen and how to regulate it. Um, so just a few words from my side before we enter into the two different panels that we have prepared for you today. Um, we have, um, I think, a, a very nice lineup and a few topics that we'd like to highlight here. Um, for the first panel, um, we would like to focus on the role of the EU's neighborhood countries. Um, what role can they play uh, in the European hydrogen market? Um, and also, in terms of regional cooperation, what kind of cooperation within or between regions, be it in the Mediterranean, Western Balkans, Eastern Partnership uh, countries, um, could be uh, feasible to promote um, this uh, pan-European hydrogen market? And what would be the best approach? We know, of course, that some countries are, let's say, more advanced in the energy transition than others. Um, should countries who are maybe a bit further behind go straight for hydrogen, or is there a role for natural gas still to play as a bridge or transition fuel? Those are the kind of questions which will be discussed in the first panel. And we are very happy to have speakers from the European Commission, the U Ukrainian Hydrogen Council, and the EIB, uh, European Investment Bank, uh, confirmed for the first panel. Then we'll have a second panel, which will focus on the role of hydrogen in sector integration. So how can hydrogen play a role to bring the electricity and gas sectors closer together and maybe force also a more holistic view on the two sectors? Um, with respect to power to gas installations, um, is can we foresee, let's say, a price spread which would make the business case uh, viable for uh, power to gas on a commercial case? Um, would hydrogen be used mainly as a balancing fuel for storage, or would it be sold mainly as feedstock for industry with the industrial clusters and the hydrogen valleys? Um, and what kind of regulatory policies uh, are needed to make sector integration and hydrogen takeoff a reality? And here we have very good speakers also again from uh, NG, uh, so from the sector, from NCG, and also from EFET uh, for the energy traders. Um, I think that's it from my side for a short introduction. I hope by now the numbers have gone up a bit more. Uh, we're almost uh, to five past the hour that we can uh, start with that. We have two moderators for you for the two panels. Um, the first one is my former colleague from Acer and now colleague at the Energy Community, Peter Poshgai. And then the second um, uh, panel will be chaired by my actual colleague, Boyko Nitsov. But for now, I'll hand over to Peter. The screen is yours. Peter, I cannot hear you. <laughs> My colleagues think that it's better if I don't speak too much. Um, so again, a very warm welcome also from my side to all the participants uh, and all the colleagues online. Um, Dennis already gave an overview of, of this panel, so to that I would just add uh, uh, a few small points. 
uh, indeed what we are after is to see how the hydrogen uh, uh, strategy can be implemented in the in the neighborhood so we will go across the border of the of the eu uh, we are fully aware that the, it is still work ongoing so so this panel will be a sort of visionary exercise uh, to see how this future hydrogen market uh, could be uh, introduced in the neighborhood countries um, why is this important uh, this, the participation of the neighborhood countries is spread out in several uh, EU strategies and policy documents, the hydrogen strategy being one of them, where the energy community is explicitly mentioned. Um, and this is because these countries will have to take the same, or at least a very similar path towards decarbonization as the EU. But this is not the only reason. Bringing hydrogen into these countries and bringing the benefits of a hydrogen economy to these countries also means technology transfer, transfer of new market opportunities, and ultimately helping them for us get to a strong post-COVID uh, recovery. That said, uh, um, I open the panel, and the first speaker in the panel is uh, Ms. Kitty Mitrai, uh, who has been a long-standing official of the European Commission in Energy. And she is currently a member of uh, the cabinet of Commissioner Simpson. Uh, I had a look at the list of her portfolio, and in fact, it's one of the longest. Uh, one of the, longest the meeting of the of the cabinet. I know it's not up to the numbers, but still, it is it is an impressive. And among these areas is the hydrogen strategy, but also the energy system integration. Uh, CCS and government, government, intergovernmental agreements with third countries. So I would say she is the best person, the best place person for this discussion. Kitty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Of course, Peter has been also a colleague of mine in the past when he was still working in the European Commission. So we all sh seem to share a common past. Indeed, hydrogen is in my portfolio. And uh, I might start with by saying that indeed hydrogen is having quite a momentum, not to say even hype. There is lots of uh, political attention on, on hydrogen across the globe. Um, and um, what we have to be careful, there have been already lots of attention on hydrogen in the past. So we have to make sure that this time it truly works out. And I do believe that it can, because this time it, the, con the conditions are really different. And I would um, just start by the three factors that I consider is different today compared to the past. Well, first of all, um, I think uh, every, everywhere around the globe, uh, now climate change and the disastrous effects of climate change are being recognized. So thanks to the Paris Agreement and, and its implementation, uh, all over the globe, uh, nations are stepping up their efforts and, and putting uh, uh, new climate neutrality targets on their agenda to drive indeed the, the fight cl uh, against climate change and to limit the temperature increase by 1.5 degrees. So this, I think, makes it for once um, such a, a condition that we will have to look for new solutions. We have to look for new technologies and this is where hydrogen comes into play as a potential new energy energy carrier for the future to decarbonize those sectors that have been so far out of reach. So I think this very strong push, uh, the attention towards climate change and the strong will to fight climate change will drive these new solutions more than they were in the past. The second uh, big factor that has changed is that the cost of renewable energies has come down, especially the cost of renewable electricity has come down. We have seen a spectacular cost decrease over the past decade. And in many parts of Europe, onshore wind and in other parts of Europe, solar power are actually the cheapest electricity generation technology. So the business case for renewable hydrogen has gotten a lot better and we expect it to be, become even better over the next, uh, next decade. And the third, that, uh, the third factor that would drive this change is uh, the system integration benefits uh, of hydrogen. And this is indeed uh, what we have come to in the system energy system integration strategy. 
is that in order to reach climate neutrality in Europe by 2050, we on the first hand have to save all the energy that we can. So we really need to make all the energy efficiencies. But second, we have to drive electrification. But there will be sectors which cannot be electrified. And in those cases, um, instead of electrification, we can use hydrogen as, as a renewable and low carbon solution to drive down emissions. So for this reason, I think hydrogen has a good momentum and, and a good potential to, to, to work. So we, we see the global interest, and I think that global interest for, comes also from the fact that hydrogen can be a solution everywhere. So it's not particular to Europe. It, it can be a very good solution also in all regions of Europe, as, and so also for the energy community. So I'm really pleased to see all the work that has gone into this to explore the potential also in the energy community for, for hydrogen. Um, so what do we need to do to turn hydrogen into a real opportunity this time? So first of all, what we said in the, in the EU strategy is that we need to scale up demand and supply in a harmonious way. So we have to, there is a kind of a chicken and egg uh, issue here um, that we, there, there are new applications for hydrogen, for example, in heavy industry, in steel making, but also in, in some areas of transport. So we have to make sure that the, the uses and the production of, of uh, clean hydrogen will be scaled up at parallel so that they can satisfy the demand. Um, so what we have come to as, as a reflection is that renewable hydrogen for the moment is expensive. While scaling up, the cost will come down, but it also means that uh, initially it should go into those sectors where it has the highest added value. So that's indeed the chemical industries, uh, some heavy duty transport uh, and, and uh, shipping, but uh, in particular also um, steel making. So there are promising projects in that. Um, but um, so what, and, and in order to produce, especially renewable hydrogen, of course we will need a lot of electricity. And I think that is another challenge and especially for the energy community countries, is to first indeed scale up also renewable electricity production, both for the electricity consumption as such, but also for the production of hydrogen in the future. So we see hydrogen markets to develop first locally, so in, in local hydrogen valleys as we, as we put into the, into the strategy. But we see also when we look at the national plans of, of, uh, of member states, that there will be regions which will produce more renewable hydrogen than they can use, or some regions will produce big or large amounts of low carbon hydrogen. Uh, and there will be other regions that will be, that we need to bring in hydrogen from, from farther away because they won't be able to produce all that hydrogen locally. And that's the moment where we expect uh, cross-border trade for hydrogen to emerge. And this is also the moment where we consider that uh, it will be important to be ready to develop projects with the neighborhood, those who have very, very high hydrogen potential. Um, and that's, of course, uh, Morocco, so the southern neighborhood, in particular Morocco, but also the energy community countries, the eastern neighborhood, and, and, the, and in particular Ukraine, that we also um, cite in the strategy. So um, there we have to make sure that, that these uh, trade can, can happen. So we also reflected what do we need for this trade to happen? And first of all, we need to develop those markets, but how can we de develop the markets for, for, for clean hydrogen? And um, there also we are acting along uh, three axes in the regulatory framework that we are putting in place this year. The first uh, axis is, um, is certification. So we need to be able to distinguish um, the, the, the hydrogen that is produced still with emissions, so from steam methane reforming or, or other technologies that still release the CO2 into the atmosphere, from the cleaner hydrogen technologies, be it renewable hydrogen through electrolysis or, uh, or um, fossil-based hydrogen with carbon capture and storage. So we need to be able to certify in order to distinguish this hydrogen and to have a, a reliable trade of clean hydrogen for the future. Then we will need um, market rules, and for, we are actually currently working on those market rules uh, as we speak. So we have just um, ended our public consultation on, on the roadmap, but by the end of the year, what we are planning is the update of the internal gas market legislation, where we intend to dedicate a, a chapter to the rules uh, for hydrogen. So it can be an, a, a chapter, it could be a self-standing regulation. We don't, or 
directive. We don't yet have this figured out. So we are inviting everyone to comment in order to, to, to really see the pros and cons of the different approaches. So th this is uh, where we will, would try to strike the right balance between facilitating a nascent market to reach maturity, but also putting the, the rules clear enough and not too constraining so that this market can develop. And then last but not least, uh, we have already tabled our proposal on the, on the regulation for trans-European networks. And that's the regulation in, in which context we have proposed hydrogen pipelines, so dedicated hydrogen pipelines and elect large-scale electrolyzers to be included in the scope of the trans-European energy networks proposal so as to be able to start planning the backbone uh, that we might need for a future cross-border hydrogen market. So the, the TENI is the place. It is now on the table of the co-legislators, but uh, that's why we're looking into how hydrogen networks can be planned in a way that's oriented for the future and will allow the hydrogen trade. So that's what's in the making, and I'm very happy to hear what's happening uh, in our neighborhood and how all this can fit together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiti, for this compact, uh, but at the same time, very comprehensive uh, uh, overview. I, I took careful notes of, uh, of, of your messages and, uh, and indeed uh, the three to-dos which you mentioned at the end, the, the certification uh, of hydrogen, uh, the, the market rules and the network, the TENI, uh, are really uh, the, the main elements. And, uh, and yeah, I think the, the public consultation is ending today on the, on the gas market rules. So from the audience, if you have something to say, uh, say it now uh, or today at least. Um, that said, uh, let's move on to keep the time. So the next speaker on the, thank you very much, Kitty. Uh, and we will have the, the questions and the comments, so we will uh, come back with the second round. So the next speaker on the panel is uh, Mr. Roland Schulze, who is a managerial advisor of low carbon energy technologies uh, in the EIB. He has also has a, a very long history working uh, in the energy sector, both in the sector itself as, and also as, uh, as in the consulting uh, part. And he has been for uh, for more than a, a decade uh, with the EIB, uh, advising on uh, on projects uh, in due, 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 due diligence uh, activities. So he has that insider view of what is needed to have uh, uh, a low carbon technology to be, to be let's say, uh, feasible and supportable. Uh, and he will share his views with us now. Uh, Roland, the floor is yours. Peter, thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me well. I have uh, chosen to illustrate my brief intervention with some slides, so to give you a bit more context. Uh, thank you very much for having EIB at this interesting panel. So my, my overall uh, perspective of this subject it is that it very it times very nicely with what we as a bank are currently doing in, in that space and uh, that we would like to consolidate our role as the EU Climate Bank. Um, so, as some of you might be aware, um, we have made three commitments, three objectives uh, recently. So, the first one is we, we want to uh, dedicate 50% of our financing by 2025 to climate action and environmental sustainability. We want to support 1 trillion of investments in these areas in the period 2021 to 2030. And we have already uh, achieved to align all of our financing activities with the principles and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so to put a bit in context to how EIB uh, operates uh, uh, generally within the European Union and outside, here you see a bit of a split uh, um, of the annual lending volumes uh, towards the region. So approximately uh, eight, nine billion uh, of financing goes to, to areas outside of, of the European Union, of which uh, uh, 1.4 to EFTA, uh, Eastern Neighbourhoods, uh, and then also 2.5 billion to, to, to the Southern, uh, southern Neighbourhood. In the context of the Climate Bank uh, objectives, we have elaborated a Climate Bank roadmap uh, that has been endorsed by the decision-making uh, bodies of the bank. Uh, and it's, uh, it uh, provides details on how we 
we would like to align our, our framework uh, with, uh, with these objectives. And uh, as we are a policy-driven bank and not policy-making, we have to align this with the, the, the policy framework given to us by, by the European institutions. Uh, not only do we have a climate bank roadmap, but we have many, many other uh, environmental, uh, sustainable and governance frameworks uh, to, so as to be able to properly justify economically our interventions. So there is a, a methodology on uh, uh, <clears throat> the economic appraisal of, of the investments. There's the energy lending policy, which is of importance here, but then there are also some other policies around environment and climate and carbon footprint. Um, so that is, uh, these are guidelines and, uh, and um, documents which operationalize the, uh, the, the, the European policy framework. Um, and what does this mean for our activities outside of the European Union? Basically, it means that these lending policies apply there too. So for example, energy and hydrogen lending activities, it would mean that we would will and have already phased out lending to fossil fuel projects. It means also that we have a, a regional focus on the neighborhood countries and other regions in accordance with the mandates given to us. Uh, and uh, we, um, we, of course, uh, focus uh, our uh, activities outside of the European Union in, in a broader discussion with the European Union's Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument. In the context of Paris alignment, we intend to support projects that, in principle, reinforce the nationally determined contributions uh, made by countries under, under the Paris Agreement. Uh, this is a bit of a repetition of what we already have heard from our previous speakers. So, of course, everybody sees hydrogen as an element to support uh, the way to carbon neutrality by 2050 as a key enabler. On the other hand, everybody knows currently hydrogen is mainly produced from fossil fuels and in, in, induced in industries where the uh, adaptation to, towards carbon neutrality by 2050 is limited. So what we currently think what is needed to enable a hydrogen economy is that it requires public support in forms of subsidies or adequate carbon prices it requires even further cost reduction uh, to, uh, I mean, through <clears throat> research and development and large-scale application uh, that can also be achieved through economies of scale, uh, establishing supply chain. Uh, and of course, we heard this already as well, it requires massive investments, even more investments into the additional production of renewable energy electricity, or if one considers to use natural gas as a source for hydrogen, then it will require massive investments in carbon capture and storage. Um, so as we are a, we want to be the climate bank and we are a bank, we have to also observe the sustainable financing regulation and the EU taxonomy. Uh, and there are some uh, thresholds and indicators at present given for, which are relevant for hydrogen, uh, for CO2 transport and CO2 storage. The experts in the taxonomy have made proposals what should be the carbon intensity of these different economic activities. Um, and these recommendations were transposed into a, re a recent draft delegated act, which is still evolving. Uh, and the numbers indicate that um, we, of course, would have to observe uh, for any of our inventions into, in that area, these carbon intensity benchmarks, which currently appear to make it uh, very difficult. Um, <clears throat> for countries outside of the European Union, there's also regulation for storage, which is which is quoted here. So that is uh, what I would like to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Roland, uh, for this uh, for this view. Uh, indeed, it's it's the let's say not harsh, but it is the reality that when it comes to financing. Uh, from the bank, the, the contracting parties are under the same treatment as the member states. So in that sense, in some areas, they are already part of the sitting in the same boat, uh, uh, so to say. And also that you mentioned this taxonomy, I understand this was a very heavily debated uh, or heavily consulted piece of legislation, but this also 
is, is a sign which shows that indeed the European legislation has a spillover effect to, to the neighborhoods and to these countries, whether they want it uh, or, or not. Um, thank you very much. Our next uh, uh, speaker on the panel is Mr. Alexander Ritkin, who is the president of the, the Ukrainian Hydrogen uh, uh, Council. <clears throat> and um, Mr. Ritkin also has a, a very rich uh, and uh, colorful career related to energy. He has been active uh, in the in the solar uh, sector, so probably he has a, a, a different angle on this whole hydrogen story. But he has also been able to witness how the policy formulation and implementation goes, because he was a uh, member of the Zaporizhia Regional Council. Um, so with this unique blend, and now in his position in the in the Hydrogen Council, I'm sure that he is now working hard uh, to to ramp up. Uh, the production and the demand uh, in Ukraine as well. So, uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. In here. Uh, thank you very much. Such a brilliant presentation. Uh, uh, I even uh, get to know some uh, teachers uh, of me that I uh, haven't known before. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, after such a brilliant uh, speech of Kitty, I even have no any jokers in my pockets uh, uh, because uh, she mentioned all spheres uh, of hydrogen implementation. I'm very happy and very satisfied that in Cabinet of uh, uh, European uh, uh, Commission, uh, there is such deep understanding of the process of integration and sectoral integration of uh, hydrogen uh, all over the Europe. And of course, you are, seeking, you are looking for uh, cooperation with uh, neighborhood countries as uh, Ukraine is. So I want to admit that the Ukraine signed an agreement uh, uh, for association and we want to be a part of Europe. And uh, of course, uh, it's a, a great uh, uh, challenge for us uh, to uh, go uh, step by step uh, uh, with all tendencies uh, which are now in European Union. And we also want to join the European Green Deal uh, and uh, uh, now there is a process of uh, re renovation of uh, our uh, uh, association agreement uh, uh, to European Union uh, in process. And our Vice Prime Minister uh, of Ukraine, uh, uh, Ms. Olga Stefanishina, is uh, uh, on the top of this process, and as well as our Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dmitry Kuleba. I want to tell that we have uh, such, uh, some already uh, done tasks, uh, our home task. We have uh, uh, two, two weeks ago, we had the presentation of uh, first uh, draft of roadmap of hydrogen in Ministry of Energy. I was responsible for this work as a head of working group of experts in hydrogen in Ministry of Energy. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, job was done with the uh, help of UNIS, uh, it's an economic uh, partnership of uh, organization of uh, United Nations uh, mission in Ukraine. And uh, uh, this uh, was the first step uh, to have our national strategy. According to statement of minister, uh, uh, Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Yaroslav Demchenkov, I think up to the, uh, in the, uh, uh, up to the end of uh, May, we will uh, have uh, a tender for national strategy and uh, uh, World Bank will help us uh, to finance this process because uh, uh, we need to uh, collect together experts uh, who are very skillful and already take part in uh, European uh, national strategies of different countries, uh, which were already set uh, uh, in uh, last some period. How Ukraine can participate? Uh, of course, uh, you know that uh, Ukraine has a brilliant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, wait a moment. Ukraine has uh, a very good uh, condition for uh, uh, renewable energy and we have a very good potential for it. For example, uh, for wind energy, uh, we are on the second place after Great Britain in uh, uh, whole Europe 
uh, in potential uh, with wind and we can easily build it uh, because our condition uh, are not so severe as uh, near the uh, seashore of Great Britain. So uh, we have a very good condition for sun. For example, uh, our southern uh, part of Ukraine is mainly looks like middle of Italy. And we have a lot of space and we have a lot of land which is not used for agriculture. So we don't need to uh, uh, take some uh, land from uh, other uh, branches of our economy and uh, use it for uh, energy. We just can uh, uh, build uh, uh, energy project without uh, any harm or for other branches. And of course, uh, process with IPSE, which are already uh, launched in uh, European Union, I mean conference uh, which was uh, on November uh, 2019 in Brussels, uh, where was uh, proclaimed uh, 12 uh, IPSE projects, uh, I mean uh, uh, Blue Danube, uh, White Horse, uh, uh, Green Frog, uh, Green Octopus, I think all these uh, projects, <laughs> yeah, they are very funny uh, in names, but uh, when I, uh, some um, budget of this project, it's become 65 billion euro, it's uh, not so funny, but uh, it's very impressive. And uh, three of this project connected directly to border of Ukraine and stops. Why it should stop on a, a border uh, with Ukraine? It should go uh, further to Ukrainian territory. And as we are natively uh, uh, connected to European Union with our pipeline, which can be used uh, for transport of hydrogen, and we did a lot uh, uh, to join our national operator of pipeline to uh, hydrogen backbone uh, uh, union, and I hope uh, it will be uh, in closest time and our national operator become a member of this union. We have uh, uh, potential of River Danube to transport hydrogen to uh, at least five countries uh, which has uh, already existing infrastructure to uh, get hydrogen uh, liquid or pressed. And of course, uh, we have uh, uh, at least 20 road connections uh, uh, for TNT corridor, which can be uh, easily uh, uh, spread to Ukraine uh, for uh, building infrastructure and so on. So, uh, in a uh, uh, few words, uh, I think uh, uh, I can speak uh, uh, much more than five or seven minutes, but I want to be in regulament. And uh, I definitely want to say that. Uh, we are running very fast uh, in uh, uh, all processes uh, which are parallel uh, legislative and economic process uh, with uh, uh, some uh, pilot projects uh, or con uh, concept of project uh, in uh, 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 territory of Ukraine with the consortium of uh, European companies. And uh, I hope this week, uh, this uh, year, uh, even uh, not looking for pandemic uh, uh, situation uh, all over the world, uh, it will be very successful for hydrogen as it uh, uh, allows us to relaunch economy of not only Ukraine, but uh, European Union in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for this, uh, for this uh, <coughs> review. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, when we were looking at the hydrogen project, these names are amazing. If you could score them by the creativity, I, I'm sure they would score very high. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but indeed, uh, all these which you mentioned, the interconnections, not only the re related to the networks, but also the other, like the River Danube, these, these are important uh, elements which, which should be taken into account. Uh, now, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we are done with the first round and we still have uh, some time. Um, questions are popping up from the audience. So maybe I will take these uh, first two questions and um, and yeah, we can do another round uh, because we are, we are still well off in time. So the first question is related uh, to the what the what in your view, the key risk to the TSOs and the DSOs is when they uh, face the introduction of the of the hydrogen, uh, and the other one uh, is uh, whether there is any time frame for developing wind and 
green hydrogen in Ukraine. So for the first one, um, I don't know, maybe Alexander and Kitty, I would address this to you unless, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, there are other views. And uh, the second one, obviously, to Alexander. So maybe Alexander start first and then uh, the others can. can... I, I, I think uh, lady first and I will uh, join. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, can you uh, one more uh, repeat first one? I was uh, concentrated when I yes. heard the screen and uh, uh, I missed uh, the first one. Yeah, the first one is about the risk, key risk which the transmission and distribution system operators face with, with the introduction of hydrogen. It's not specified that they're electricity or gas, maybe. I will I will I will briefly uh, answer because I uh, now in the process with the national this uh, uh, operator in this process and we are in a research uh, uh, in a research study uh, now so <clears throat> Uh, according to our uh, technical condition uh, of equipment uh, and technical uh, condition of uh, uh, pipeline, uh, we definitely can prove that uh, about 15% of mixture of hydrogen can be easily added to national pipeline and uh, everything will work correctly. If we want to increase this uh, percentage, we need to make uh, 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 some reconstruction of uh, pipeline and we, uh, uh, I think up to the end of uh, summer we will uh, definitely know what will be the scenario, how we can uh, uh, transport uh, hydrogen which will be produced in a definite region of Ukraine, uh, which, uh, in, uh, which affect this process. Now we are uh, looking uh, some uh, routes and some scenario because uh, we know that uh, in four years uh, uh, the amount of natural gas which will be go through uh, our national pipeline will be def uh, uh, extremely reduced because uh, Russian Federation uh, find a way how to uh, reduce the amount of uh, gas which will be go through uh, Ukraine via Ukraine. So this is why. Uh, part of the uh, national pipeline will be out of use and we uh, need to know what will be the second life of our pipeline. And uh, uh, we already have a uh, uh, fourth scenario how it can be. Even I can, uh, uh, after our meeting, I can uh, make maybe some uh, short uh, notice and uh, short uh, uh, map of how it can be and send it to you or maybe to share with the all participants. We know how it uh, can be, but we need to go deeply into research. And uh, um, but uh, our technical specialists uh, see no problem, as I say, 15 percent. 15 percent, it's a very good amount uh, to start. And uh, uh, the main thing is how we who will be the final consumer of this mixture and uh, in Europe and uh, how this uh, uh, mixture will go through European countries, uh, for example, Slovakia, for example, uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, uh, how it can be. And uh, uh, if, for example, we have a final consumer in Germany, can he get this uh, mixture uh, definitely in Germany, uh, go through all European countries? So I think this question will be solved uh, uh, definitely in a uh, uh, hydrogen backbone unit because uh, in this unit uh, all uh, biggest uh, national operator of European countries is. And uh, the second question uh, was uh, how, uh, can you repeat please? Uh, I, I didn't hear you, I don't yes, hear you. Uh, the, the, the second one was about uh, the time frame for, for uh, developing yes. green. Sorry, uh, time frame. We are uh, in process uh, already for one year. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, we uh, sign a new memorandum for new energy uh, cooperation between Ukraine and Germany, we already, I was uh, presented some projects uh, uh, in hydrogen. I was a, a member of official delegation with our Ministry of Energy. Uh, when we signed this agreement with uh, Mr. Altmaier, 
in Berlin and uh, we presented uh, uh, some projects and some concept of projects. Of course, uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, need to show how uh, three uh, parts of the project can be combined. Uh, potential for renewable, logistic and water, pot uh, water potential, because uh, we need to produce uh, uh, mainly green hydrogen uh, using uh, electrolysis technology. For electrolysis, we need water. And we need to find uh, uh, how much water do we need not to harm environmental uh, of the region. So uh, this uh, uh, gives us uh, also some regions of Ukraine which are best suited for uh, such production. And I hope uh, all this production there will be uh, all mainly on southern part of Ukraine and some of them in uh, a border with the Poland uh, because they are, uh, very good, have very good condition for wind and has water potential. Uh, they will be situated near national pipeline to have entered to national pipeline and in future to do it. I, I hope that it can be possible in next uh, three, five years. Because uh, in this year, I think we definitely will find the uh, old scenario and uh, uh, know what the reconstruction we need uh, to make it happen. And of course, in the southern part of Ukraine, uh, where is this situated uh, seaports, uh, when it's uh, possible to carry uh, liquid hydrogen or pressed hydrogen by uh, special container uh, uh, and uh, transport it. Uh, uh, using uh, potential of uh, ships uh, and seaports. I hope uh, I, I saw this uh, research in uh, uh, hydrogen Europe. They uh, uh, find the way and also find the routes how ships uh, can go to Amsterdam or one more port, Hamburg, and uh, get uh, hydrogen uh, to these ports. And uh, even uh, I saw the projects uh, when uh, the hydrogen uh, will be transported to the sports from uh, uh, Morocco and from uh, uh, North uh, Africa um, countries. So uh, uh, I think that uh, some pilot project will be already uh, uh, started this year. I'm uh, sure that uh, it uh, uh, can be. Of course, there will be not uh, an industrial size, but uh, it can demonstrate uh, all uh, the process and uh, possibility how to use it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexander, for this overview. I think this so partly also replied to another question uh, about which are the pilot projects with, uh, with foreign consortiums. But just to keep the, the balance, uh, I would uh, uh, come uh, to the question which is addressed to Kitty uh, and which is uh, related to blending of hydrogen, how blending uh, into the, to the gas grid could help uh, or create the hydrogen uptake, how basically Alexander could sell hydrogen to Germany. I'm joking, not personally, of course. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Alexander. Um, just maybe if I can quickly react on the ports and the shipping, um, because I found it very fascinating, um, especially the part that, uh, well, shipping is a sector that's difficult to decarbonize. And in shipping, you have ammonia, which is a direct hydrogen product, which is the great technological promise of decarbonizing the shipping industry, together with methanol that can also be be produced from from hydrogen so i do think that maybe that's that's the great potential for when you have a port and hydrogen production to drive uh, the decarbonization of shipping and possibly also more more efficient to transport in these liquid forms rather than compressed or or, or cooled hydrogen but on the blending question that we get a lot and we discuss this a lot um first of all i would like to look at the the hydrogen from the user side because the way hydrogen will be used will have a direct impact whether it should be blended or not. And um, in the first time, when you will have these industrial applications that will need pure hydrogen, or like the, the, the fuel cells that will need pure hydrogen, blending is not really the solution because they need the high 
added high value added and and high value product uh, for these processes. So that's their blending is not the the right way to do. However, when you have like a local hydrogen value where you have uh, um, hydrogen already produced from the excess renewable energy and, and, and electrolyzers that, that produces the local hydrogen, and then you can inject directly the excess hydrogen into the grid, their blending is of, of, of added value. So I would not generalize blending as being good or, 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 or not good. I would just look at it from the perspective of the user of the hydrogen and see in a specific case what is needed. So that's also the reason why we were in the first place not promoting bending per se. I mean, some will do it and that's fine. And especially at local, at local level, it can make a lot of sense. But at the, the, the cross-border transport level, we believe that we will need also the transport of pure hydrogen. And that will either require dedicated networks or new technologies uh, for, for, for transporting maybe natural gas and hydrogen so that they can be either separated again or transported in parallel without ever mingling. But we do believe that uh, at the current state of affairs that we might need pure hydrogen in its pure form and not being blended. So that's why we don't generally uh, support blending as such. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kitty. Now, uh, following up on this blending uh, discussion uh, a bit, uh, uh, Roland from the panel asked uh, Alexander about uh, the the fifteen percent. Uh, what what injecting hydrogen to the gas grid up to fifteen percent would uh, would mean? It would be used mainly for electricity production. Uh, I understand, Roland. The question is more about uh, you know what would be the added value. But please uh, jump in. Uh, you have the the privilege to make your question. Yeah, no, I was thinking. No, I, I don't want to dominate uh, that discussion with uh, some question. But I was wondering. Uh, I mean, if one would have methane and uh, hydrogen in a gas network, what the purpose of the? I mean, what the demand side would be if it is. Uh, I mean, if there were studies made to to look at the demand side and who will take up that gas mixture and if it would be mainly considered for electricity or, or if if the majority of that transported gas mixture is considered for other purposes so maybe somebody has a view on this uh may I, if you don't mind uh, I think uh, for electricity purpose uh, it could be, but uh, uh, as uh, Kitty mentioned, uh, uh, the main production which should be uh, decarbonized is production of steel. And uh, even when we were in Germany, uh, we uh, have uh, several discussions, one with the German uh, biggest consortium, one of them was ThyssenKrupp. And they say that uh, the demand for hydrogen uh, for decarbonization of their production is very huge. They, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they say about 2 million ton per year when uh, they want to uh, fully uh, be uh, ecological neutral. The same situation is in Romania and Galats. Uh, there is a biggest steel production and it's situated uh, uh, 30 kilometers from a region in which potentially green hydrogen can be produced in Ukraine. And uh, you see, we even can speak about uh, uh, own project uh, pipeline, not national one, but uh, uh, for 50 kilometers to make a new pipeline, uh, it's much more easier than to adopt something. Because in France, I saw technology for uh, pipe production, which can support 100% of hydrogen and without any leaks and uh, it's uh, uh, a pipeline which is produced uh, from plastic uh, with a special cover so uh, i think that uh, uh, mainly it will be uh, if we speak about uh, transportation with a pipeline i think mainly it will be industrial projects uh, and uh, steel production if we speak about uh, any other uh, way of transportation i think First, it will be transport, uh, because uh, 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 six uh, of IPSA projects, uh, which I mentioned with the funny names, uh, they are uh, concentrated on uh, vehicle production. 
and uh, heavy truck production, uh, municipal uh, transport. And for them, of course, they need hydrogen uh, and uh, uh, can be uh, refilled uh, by uh, this hydrogen, uh, uh, which can be transported to uh, European countries with a container, because it's uh, easily to change it. Alexander, I'm very sorry we are uh, coming to the end of the panel. And, okay, uh, okay. We have to be very strict. Uh, but uh, yes, indeed, uh, when when we talk about blending, I just recall old memories from my uh, guess uh, uh, history where we were discussing the, the network code on interoper interoperability. Exactly. And what a big issue there was related to the gas quality. Also, when it came to liquefied natural gas, what the band should be which should be tolerated. So, so compared to, to hydrogen, that was just a piece of cake discussion, I would say. And back at that time, it seemed very tough. So I'm really looking forward to how the, the discussions uh, will go uh, for, for, for this part. Uh, thank you very much uh, to, to all the panelists. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure and an honor to, to have you today here. Please stay as long as you can. Uh, I understand that uh, some of you have meetings, so uh, you may uh, leave at a certain point. And with this, uh, I say thank you for the audience for listening to the panel one. And I hand back to the master of ceremonies, Adam, who will be the bridge to panel two, or he yes. shows me that just no end. need to bridge. Give the floor directly to Boyko Nitsov, uh, who will moderate panel two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Hello, everybody, uh, and thank you for having me over the honor and the pleasure, and also the role of timekeeper of the second panel to this uh, today's series. Uh, it would actually be the closing panel of the entire series. It is an interesting uh, topic, sector integration. The uh, topic actually came up in the discussion uh, previous panel already a couple of times at least. And I sometimes, frankly speaking, uh, have the feeling that uh, we are talking about uh, one and the same thing from different angles. And one of that angle is, uh, can we talk about um, sector integration or are we talking about really market integration? What is the role of hydrogen? Will it be primarily an input to industrial processes, as you just mentioned? Will it be a primarily a carrier of energy, a vector of energy which can be transposed, uh, converted to other forms of energy, be it electricity or heat or other purposes. Where are the boundaries of the markets if uh, hydrogen has many heads to carry out, many roles to play? And in this uh, moving environment, what is the role of regulation? Where, what, what should be regulated, to what extent so that so the goals of the Green Deal and the goals of building a functional, competitive, integrated market for hydrogen are actually implemented. Today, the panel is uh, composed of, of three distinguished speakers who touch on, on these uh, issues, I hope. And so those speakers are François Xavier Rivieri of NG Hydrogen, Executive Vice President, Louis Watin, Deputy Director of System Development for NSOC, and Doug Wood, Chairman of the Gas Committee. I think between the three of them, we have about 100 years of expertise in the energy sector, which they could uh, share with us today. And well, with this, François, the floor is yours. We can see you, but we cannot hear you, Francois. Working on it. Thank you. Sorry, I was uh, muted uh, by the, the organizers. Sorry about that. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Boyko, for, for your introduction. Can, can you hear me now? Indeed, loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so th thank you, thank you for your introduction, and and uh, and uh, very happy to be with you today. It's uh, uh, it's obviously uh, some some very uh, critical questions that that you raise about the role of hydrogen, and maybe to sh share with you uh, our experience within NG about uh, a few years now uh, trying to to develop a hydrogen project. Uh, the the role we see in in hydrogen for uh, sector integration is, is really major and critical for us. Uh, it has been reminded previously that uh, electricity demand in Europe is going to increase uh, and it is projected to increase as, as a path to carbon neutrality and with uh, even additional uh, targets have been having been raised recently uh, with, with the Green Deal. Uh, this means that we trust in the potential in Europe and there is a strong willingness of the European Commission uh, to raise the targets and, and there are some potential of development uh, within Europe of uh, renewable energy because this is, this is what we target. Uh, if you take only the potential of offshore wind, uh, we, we see from, from the projections of the European Commission that we could reach between 300 to 400 uh, uh, gigawatt by 2050, while it is today around 20 gigawatt uh, uh, in, in Europe. So the, the potential of development of renewable in the offshore, also uh, in, in, in the solar farm in the south of uh, Europe, uh, spe uh, specifically in Portugal, uh, is huge. But that raises a lot of issues in terms of integration uh, into the, the, the system of these, these new capacities. And uh, this is where hydrogen has a, has a role to play, uh, both in terms of transport, as was uh, previously discussed, but also in terms of storage. Um, and, and we see that uh, hydrogen offers uh, the solution and the missing link uh, today uh, to reach those two targets. First, talking about uh, transport, we see that if we develop these new capacities of intermittent uh, renewable sources, uh, we are going to need to transport it. And transporting molecules is approximately 10 times cheaper than building electric lines. So you see uh, immediately the role that uh, H2, renewable H2, is likely to play uh, in, a, in, a, in a trend where we will integrate more and more renewable into the energy mix. Storage is essential as well uh, due to the intermittency because if we want to be able to um, to answer to the to, to the demand of our clients and we see when we develop projects uh, uh, with the steel industry of, with refineries if you are not able to store uh, some some large amounts of, of uh, hydrogen then you create a risk within the industrial process of uh, our clients and and of course this is not acceptable and if you want to be able also to sustain the network with an additional capacity of renewable high volume storage like the one you can you, you can develop in, in salt caverns and, and, and there are many in Europe are essential to provide the security of supply that will be needed uh, with, with a much stronger renewable energy mix. So that shows uh, uh, that without a doubt uh, hydrogen will, will have to play a role in sector integration. It, means uh, nevertheless several things in terms of uh, how to achieve that and that was already shared by previous speakers so so I will not develop that too 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 much but you need basically two things the first thing is to solve the the the, the issue of competitiveness of renewable hydrogen and here uh, we welcome very much all the national plans and the European plans that are supporting the development of hydrogen. Uh, there is a, a work ongoing, you have a lot of programs or, already defined and some uh, in the making at national level uh, and they support the uh, uh, going at scale of uh, electrolyzers and, and production capacities and, and, and there are some challenges, many challenges uh, again uh, on this, but at least we see a very strong tr uh, trend. But the second thing uh, is the topic we're addressing today, which are the infrastructure. Uh, 
And when, when I'm talking about infrastructure, again, it's pipelines, it's storage, it's potentially terminals uh, if uh, uh, if it happens that we import hydrogen from uh, from neighboring countries. Uh, and here um, it is uh, essential to develop this today to be able to connect the various hubs of production uh, that uh, will be generated uh, in the near future in terms of uh, uh, electrolysis capacity. And just to, to give you some illustration of, uh, of uh, the project we are developing and which uh, 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 illustrate uh, the, the, the immediate presence and immediate need for support on this, I'll, I'll, I'll go through with you a, a few examples of the projects we are developing. In, for instance, in, in the south of France, we are currently working with, with Total uh, on uh, building a production facility of hydrogen, which will be entirely supplied by dedicated solar farms, massive solar farms, that will integrate uh, the, um, uh, the, the renewable uh, path of Total uh, towards RED2. And here you see that you develop new capacities of, of electricity, of renewable electricity, and you have to solve the issue of being able to produce hydrogen and deliver it to, to a specific industrial site. Um, in uh, further north, uh, we have a project which, which is called High Green, where we intend to deploy massively uh, some solar farms in the region of, of Luberon and uh, to uh, produce hydrogen and store it into some salt caverns of storage uh, to be able to supply with a reasonable uh, uh, um, uh, security of supply uh, the, the southern part of France where you have a consumption ba basin in terms of H2. So here we activate both the electricity part, the production large scale of hydrogen, but also pipelines and storage, which are necessary to answer the demand in, in terms of hydrogen as a feedstock. Another example uh, of this activation is what uh, GRT Gaz is currently doing, uh, which is the, the first uh, uh, interconnection of uh, H2 pipelines between, between France, Luxembourg and Germany. So that is a first feature of what we were talking previously of interconnection facilities and interconnecting infrastructure. And maybe a last example to illustrate what, what was mentioned uh, previously is also a project we have in Portugal, where we see that there is a willingness of several actors, EDP, GALP uh, and REN, to develop renewable energy to activate the full value chain feedstock uh, supplied for refineries, injection into the gas network, and export to Northern Europe, uh, spe specifically the Netherlands. So we see that projects are here, but there are some cer certain hurdles that we still need to, to, to overcome. Um, technology is not in itself a hurdle because you see that uh, a lot of technology are mature, but competitiveness uh, is. And uh, it's great to see that the European Commission is uh, very active on the various signs to send to the market in terms of support, but also in terms of uh, the roadmap of development of infrastructure. Um, now, what we see is uh, one of the challenges that we see that countries do not specifically um, have consistent framework. Uh, on, on this question of development of infrastructure. If you take Germany, for instance, they have a very strong stance into the development of networks to transport hydrogen over long distances. While in France, it is less perceived as an urgency uh, to develop those networks and to make sure that we prepare the future uh, of tomorrow uh, in, in terms of uh, supplying hydrogen over long distance. So there is a need uh, for consistency in terms of regulation. That's a very important thing. And it doesn't necessarily come with the regulation of networks, which will be necessary, but it, it, it comes through specific targets, specific targets of uh, 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 adopting hydrogen in industry to make sure that the value chain is, developed, is developing and that uh, um, we, we were in the capacity to reduce the price and, and, and propose uh, uh, an economic alternative to uh, existing fuels. So that's, that's one major issue. 
The second issue is obviously uh, supports, financial supports, and uh, uh, and and the role of um, of countries and uh, Europe in, in respect to that. And there is a lot of money uh, in the table now. The projects happen to develop now, and it is very important again that there is consistency in those support schemes, so that uh, those first step, which are always the most difficult are achieved and that they're achieved in a consistent manner making sure we develop both production and the development of its infrastructure which will allow some remote areas to benefit from all this hydrogen economy and the hydrogen society so this is what i wanted to share with you in terms of, of insights of uh, where we stand today uh, so very very short message we are developing projects now, the projects are there, the technology is there. It's just now a question of consistency uh, in regulation and consistency in support uh, and activation of the partnership, public and private. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for marking uh, not just uh, the, the expected benefits, uh, but also the expected issues that uh, the hurdles that have yet to be resolved. Obviously, one of the benefits um, of hydrogen is uh, the scale effects positive that hydrogen has in transportation versus uh, electricity networks another one is obviously the supportive storage security of supply in general terms and thank you also for marking such uh, issues yet to be resolved uh, such as uh, scale the competitiveness uh, the reasonable cost of supply of hydrogen, the consistency of regulation and consistency of support schemes. There are questions coming uh, in uh, the chat box. Uh, so at the end uh, of uh, this panel, we, I hope we'll have a little bit of time to take at least some of those questions. So please, uh, thank you. Uh, Louis Vatin, the, the floor is yours. Tell us uh, what you think about sector integration. Thank you, Boyko. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed, loud and clear. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for having me here today. And I would like also to thank the previous presenters for very good uh, and clear presentations. Um, I have a um, short presentation I would like to share. I will just ask. Uh, Boyko, if you see my... Uh... Yes, the presentation is running. Yeah. Okay, so it's the big one, not the presenter view. Full screen, I mean. It, it looks fine to me, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, yeah. Um, energy sector integration. Uh, I would like to just start with the different scenarios. Um, for the past years, European regulations um, have succeeded in delivering the current secure and liquid energy markets. There are still a few missing pieces, but we are almost there. And today, clearly, the priority is to tackle the climate change, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, and to reach net zero by 2050. And what we can see is that all scenarios and energy strategies you can see out there, they all have something in common. They are all pointing at hydrogen for being one of the most important elements to reach this target. So in ENSOG, we do not make any forecasts for the future energy demand. Um, so what you will see here are no forecasts. However, with our electricity colleagues of ENSOE and with the involvement of many stakeholders, we assess how the objectives set by the European Commission could impact the energy system. Uh, you even have probably already attended one of our uh, numerous workshops, I hope. Uh, however, anyway, to do so, uh, we translate those objectives into different possible scenarios that uh, I'm presenting here on this slide. Uh, one scenario that we call national trends is reflecting the different national policies or let's say the NECPs as we know them today. And we have two other scenarios that we call COP21 scenarios, which reflect the Green Deal objectives and which have a very different impact on the operation of the infrastructure, depending on whether the EU will go towards more self-sufficiency 
and local solutions, that's the distributed energy scenario you can see here, or whether the EU will be more active in the global energy transition and participate to a global decarbonized energy market with bigger imports and large-scale solutions. This is the global ambition scenario we have here. Uh, of course, the reality should stand somewhere in the middle. Those are just scenarios to test the infrastructure. But what is very interesting uh, when we develop those scenarios is that whatever path you take, our joint scenarios show that you will need all technologies available if you want to reach net zero by 2050. And in all those scenarios, this includes significant shares of hydrogen. This is why we are convinced that if we go toward this uh, net zero economy, hydrogen will play a, a major role. Now, um, this slide, sorry, it's a, a rather a complicated diagram, this Sankey diagram, but it's a very good one when we want to discuss the energy system integration, which is the topic for today. Um, as soon as you start looking at the energy system in a comprehensive uh, or integrated way, uh, you see that hydrogen is playing a central role, uh, as it is a direct link between gas and electricity. Until now, we were used to gas being, uh, let's say, used for producing electricity. So this is the interaction you see here, where natural gas or biogas could be used to produce electricity. But with the new EU energy and climate objectives, uh, the role of power to gas and hydrogen is now also becoming another key element for the energy system integration with the power to gas uh, dimension. Um, and there are three, let's say, main reasons why uh, hydrogen um, will play a key role in this future. Sorry. Um, first, the first one is that power to gas can offer flexibility to the electricity system. As it was mentioned, uh, electrification of end uses will continue to grow, whether it will be 50, 60 percent, whatever uh, percentile, uh, that's not really what matters, but we know it will, it will grow. And a direct consequence of this electrification is that the electricity demand will grow more and more seasonal. Um, just for comparison, you can see the difference uh, for the annual gas and electricity demand, and I'm not even here showing uh, what it would look like if you were to include transport and other sectors that are uh, not really gasified or electrified so far. Um, so um, this demand will grow seasonal and uh, power to gas can offer a lot of flexibility to the electricity system when the demand is not matching the production. I think that was mentioned by, by Kitty. That we try to see how demand and supply can grow together, but we know there will be some, let's say, inadequacy uh, in some places, in some instances, uh, maybe for some time. Uh, and we can see that, for instance, in summer, uh, when electricity prices are super low or even negative because you have a lot of production from solar and wind, but rather limited demand on the electricity side here, what you can do, uh, you could, of course, um, use these surplus um, uh, electricity produced to convert it to hydrogen to uh, inject it into the grid and to store it for the next season um, because that's also the big difference with the gas storage. You can store it for more years if you like. Um, so whatever uh, you could produce from wind and sun can be integrated into the gas system. I think this is very important. Um, and uh, when we talk about gas storage here, we are talking about hundreds of terawatt hours. So nothing comparable with the batteries. Uh, it's really huge capacities. Now, the other way around, uh, hydrogen can offer some flexibility to produce low carbon electricity in winter when there is low rest production. So you would have uh, low production of wind and sun. However, you want to produce green electricity and there uh, the hydrogen network can uh, supplement other sources to produce uh, low carbon electricity. Like, for instance, during uh, so-called Kalte Dunkelflaute event. So in winter when it's cold, dark and there is no wind uh, or simply the snow is just uh, on every solar panel. Uh, so that's the, the first point, the flexibility uh, dimension. Then hydrogen has a significant uh, potential to decarbonize the gas system. That's the second element. I think it was mentioned earlier. Um, 
by François Xavier, there is a large potential in the EU for renewable, uh, renewable energy, especially offshore wind in the north and uh, solar in southern Europe. And uh, renewable hydrogen can therefore be produced in sufficient quantities to complete the decarbonization of the gas system. And here, again, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of terawatt hours per year. Not to mention, uh, of course, the extra EU potential, including uh, the energy community countries. Now, um, last point and not least, uh, hydrogen is also very fit for the transition, meaning that the integrated methane and hydrogen gas system can be a uh, chicken and egg problem solver. As it was uh, said, I think, by Kitty, there is this uh, chicken and egg issue. Demand may develop before uh, or faster than supply or the other way around. Uh, and when you look at the integrated methane and hydrogen gas system, uh, you can see that anyway, in all scenarios, developing the hydrogen backbone is essential. But why the pure hydrogen system is scaling up um, and the renewable hydrogen production because uh, it is surplus or simply small scale, it can be blended into the gas network. Uh, and therefore, there is, uh, you, you are still supporting this scaling up of, um, of renewable generation. Uh, on the other side of the consumption chain, the hydrogen demand can also be satisfied if there is not enough production by either the blending uh, in the gas system. I know there are also some projects in Germany. I think Contrast has a, a pilot project there. Uh, so it can be deblended, or uh, you could also use blue and turquoise hydrogen uh, in a transition phase at least, and as a very reliable backup, because you could also use the existing methane grid at the beginning as a very reliable backup for the hydrogen um, gas hydrogen system. So um, this is why it will surely play a central role. And then my uh, last slide, um, the role of gas uh, or hydrogen in general in the integrated system. Talking about energy system integration, um, it's a limited vision of the integrated system to only consider the use of hydrogen as balancing fuel or feedstock. Our scenarios show that hydrogen cannot be limited to those aspects. If we want to reach net zero, all technologies are needed in all sectors. This is why technology neutrality is key, by the way, when it comes to the regulatory principle. Electrification. Um, again, there is no question today that besides energy efficiency improvements, further electrification is needed in our scenarios. We reach uh, between yeah, around 50, 55% of electrification by 2050. Um, and um, even though uh, this is not sufficient, not all sectors can be electrified. And even with those amounts of electrification uh, that I was just showing you, gas and hydrogen will be needed, needed sorry, in many sectors like heating, industry, transport, uh, especially because of its high energy content on top, of course, of the feedstock we needs more purity. Uh, and even with warmer years on average, winters will still be colder than summers. So there will be this seasonality. Uh, and with increasing electrification and electricity demand comes also increasing flexibility needs. Regarding the price spread, because that was also one of the elements uh, in, in, the, in the agenda, uh, sector integration may not only introduce further gas and electricity, let's say spot price interactions, but also seasonal interaction, as we see it for gas today. Um, indeed, if um, you look at the gas system, since we have large gas storage capacities, almost one third of the total winter demand today, market participants can already adapt their strategies based on the seasonal price spreads. So not only gas and electricity, but also this time dimension. So just to summarize, uh, when you look at the entire energy system in an integrated way, not only gas and electricity, you can see that the challenge ahead when it comes uh, to decarbonization, um, you can see the challenge. Uh, and uh, you can see that hydrogen will necessarily take an important role in many sectors, in many different ways. So we discussed gaseous liquid forms, pure associated with other uh, elements like ammonia or methanol, it was mentioned. Uh, all of this 
is needed if we want to reach net zero 2050. And uh, furthermore, this is not a fixed environment and the role of hydrogen may also evolve over time with the development of the different technologies. Uh, but what we see in all scenarios, not only ours, is that you should start, uh, it should start to play a, a role now to limit the total amount of greenhouse gases the EU will emit while reaching 2050. Otherwise, further investments in negative emissions technologies will be needed after 2050. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank, thank you, Louis. I, I think uh, I think that was uh, quite insightful, at least from several viewpoints. Uh, the the challenge uh, actually is system wide, as as you mentioned, and in this context, it's not uh, just the electricity and gas nexus. It's not uh, just uh, the methane and hydrogen nexus. Uh, the bird's eye view over the entire system is is uh, needed, and well. In this context, the bird's eye view over the system, hydrogen is obviously not going to be the only solution. There will be other solutions as well, but it will be probably a major factor. And well, thank you for not hiding that in this, uh, this uh, bird's eye view, there could be quite a lot of, uh, of good things, bad things, and ugly things, depending on where exactly you go system-wide. In the nukes of the system, Boyko, I can't hear you. For whatever reason, uh, I got cut, cut away, and I don't know at which point I got cut away. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. So, I was saying that, well, thank you to you, to Louis, for not hiding uh, for us uh, that uh, in different nooks of the bird's eye view over the system, there could be good things, uh, there could be bad things, there could be ugly things, and it has to be focused approach uh, depending on what exactly are we talking about. So whether we're talking about uh, gas and electricity, industrial use, heat applications, and not forget uh, the fact that after all should be in the interest of the user or the consumer. With this, I give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Doug uh, Wood who is uh, the chair of, of the Gas Committee of EFET. Uh, uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, Boyko, and thanks for the invitation uh, to, to speak today. I'm having a little trouble putting up my slides at the moment is the only problem. Uh, and I'd just like to, I, I've just got a couple of slides, one picture to speak to. So I, uh, if you'll bear with me a second. We can see the slide, Doug, uh, on the screen, the you triangle. See, you see the all... triangle? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Not anymore, though. Oh, hold on. You are sharing the screen and, yes. You and see it again. You, yes. And if you may put it up on um, on the presentation mode. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Like that, that's working perfectly. Sorry. I, I, I think I did that by, by accident more than design. Uh, but thank you very much, and thanks to thanks to Louis for the for the previous presentation, which um, covered a number of things which I'd like to mention today, but also some things I, I would like to uh, to disagree with from the viewpoint of how traders actually look at the market uh, and how we make decisions based on price signals to uh, either to optimize use of the the existing grids and the the assets available on those grids to balance the energy system as a whole, or indeed to make investment decisions. Although that is increasingly becoming um, a more complex issue as we move away from energy only pricing towards capacity based pricing and other instruments in order to drive particular investment decisions. But let, let me put up, put up this triangle, um, which some of you may have seen before, uh, as, as an attempt of ours to try to think of, to, to move to how the different vectors interact. Because uh, what the, the, the language we currently use tends to uh, talk about gases in general and use natural gas and hydrogen interchangeably. And we talk about gas storage as if it's, you know, we just stick something in there, whether it's natural gas or hydrogen. But the actual development of the individual assets, because I, I, I agree uh, very strongly with what, what um, Kitty said right at the beginning, is there will need to be some 
um, pure hydrogen networks, whether at a cross-border basis or for feedstock or for local needs, as well as natural gas. Um, and they, they have different physical requirements. They may be blended at times, um, but at other times the uh, hydrogen will need to exist separately and will need to have uh, individual assets and ways of balancing the hydrogen system, the natural gas and blending system, and the electricity system. And if we want to do that economically, it's, it's using the tools available because uh, also in this diagram, um, I've just put down some ideas and storage. So what we have in electricity is really only very short-term storage, primarily for grid stability. And, the, and the, the other flexibility for electricity comes from dispatchable generation. But of course, as we move towards um, a greater uh, intermittent content, the proportion of dispatchable plants um, needs to be replaced. What we have at the moment, um, particularly for CCGTs, we'll need to replace with something else. And the question of, you know, will that be hydrogen? Within hydrogen, um, there's some initial work on, on using salt caverns for storage of hydrogen, um, but we're still a long way off demonstrating whether depleted fields, for example, are capable of longer term storage of hydrogen. Hydrogen molecules are smaller. They disappear into different uh, cracks in rock compared to methane. Um, you have risk of microbial interaction that contaminates the hydrogen. If you put hydrogen into a into a reservoir, um, there's no guarantee you'll get hydrogen back out. You're more likely to get high proportions of methane back out initially, and then you'll get a blend. And then eventually, um, after so many cycles, you may get hydrogen back out. Uh, but it depends on other things, depending on the rock structure. So there's some big assumptions around there about hydrogen's ability to um, to cope with the, the, the seasonality that is currently provided by natural gas. But as a backstop, we still have natural gas, and, and as long as you can you can store in a natural gas format, that's still there as a backup, which was one of the points that Louis said. And of course, we have different um, technologies for moving energy between those vectors. We can move gas, we can move energy from electricity to hydrogen through electrolysis, and we move it back again through fuel cells or turbines. We can exchange hydrogen for natural gas either through methanation or we can reform the natural gas into hydrogen with CCUS um, or, or via pyrolysis, for example, in a way to ensure that that contributes to the greenness. Uh, and of course, we can generate electricity using natural gas, but that arrow goes only in one direction. It's not so easy or not so commercial to turn electricity back into natural gas. Although if it's part of a large portfolio, and this is where markets are, are particularly good, uh, optimizing across the portfolio, we can commercially turn electricity back into natural gas um, through substituting and not necessarily by converting it to hydrogen, converting, methanizing the hydrogen and then storing it in a depleted fuel. And, and as long as we have markets that, uh, that work and that send good price signals for optimization, we can create many of these um, products synthetically in ways that respond to commercial needs, provide commercial price signals, and allow storage of electricity in the form of molecules or allowing molecules to help provide grid stability and electricity grids. So these things are possible. So, uh, the, uh, over, so the, the, the physical interaction between these vectors is, is absolutely crucial at being able to set that up but also having um, markets, working markets in each of those vectors, but also recognizing that there is a, uh, commercially, there is a, an overall energy market that we are trying to meet uh, supply and demand at all times of the year and relevant uh, about the necessary amounts of uh, security of supply. So let me hope this turns out. So just a few, um, points that arise from this diagram and for more general thoughts. And it's important to remember the hydrogen market does not exist in isolation. We see this very much as part of three interconnected physical markets. They each require to have their own balance, but they also have the ability through conversion of energy from one vector to another to provide balancing and ancillary service in each other's markets. So there are, there are there, there's a much greater inter-commodity interaction um, as well as the, the, the establishment of those different markets. And commercially, traders who are, who are already in, and indeed asset investors who are already in, uh, in electricity and, and um, natural gas markets will additionally be engaged in, um, in, in hydrogen markets with the ability to manage those risks across all three. 
and of course that interacts as well with another market that's not not um, not depicted on that diagram and it's the market for environmental instruments so uh, the ETS or the way we're discussing um, either voluntary duels or mandatory certificates uh, the ex the extent at which they can be, the meeting the extent with which they can be uh, separated and traded independently of energy commodity products um or or or, or, or attached um, will also have an important influence on how these uh, how these things take effect. Um, the conversion of storage is is not does not exist in its form. We already have the the the, the, the amount of flexibility that is produced um, either from the on the on the supply side to uh, dispatch or switch off um, dispatchable generation to increase imports or or gas production. Um, or to increase or reduce hydrogen production, as well as demand side management. These all compete with storage and with each other. And through energy conversion, we can have uh, flexibility in, in, in gas supporting um, changes in demand on the, on the power side and vice versa. So a couple of interesting, confusing things which will need to be reviewed as part of any uh, any package. I can't, we noticed that hydrogen storage is currently governed by the uh, by the electricity directive, as long as it's produced by um, as long as it's produced by electricity. But if we were to store that in a in a gas salt cavern, then it would be covered by both the electricity directive and the gas directive. So there's some regulatory questions we need to sort out. Here. But most important of all um, is the treatment of reg is the treatment of regulated assets and private investment. Uh, and this is one area where I must disagree um, strongly with Louis in the last presentation and express concerns about the inclusion of electrolysis within the 10E directive. Because although electrolyzers can be described in an infrastructure type way of having capacities and providing third party access, in actual fact, what they are doing in terms of the electricity side is they are competing with ancillary services. They are competing with privately owned batteries, which are very much in the competitive sector in order to provide grid stability. And on the power side, they are competing with hydrogen production, which is also a competitive activity. So there is a big risk here that if we, if we have regulated um, technologies, uh, like electrolysis and use of uh, line pack, which is generally part of a regulated base, competing with privately owned and privately invested batteries and other electricity storage technologies, we create um, significant danger in, uh, in, in confidence in being able to continue to invest privately. And there's a risk of crowding out investment in that sector, and it moves very much more into a, uh, into a, a, a regulated sector, um, which is what we you know, would try to avoid. Um, other important things I think we mentioned here is um, to see the risk, particularly within uh, national approaches to um, national hydrogen markets, uh, the risk of moving away from the successes of the internal energy markets for gas and for electricity, uh, to have an internal energy market from hydrogen, which needs a regulated framework. It needs, wherever possible, to have common rules established, a common framework for those markets set at an EU level, uh, and incorporating common quality requirements to to uh, ensure that we have uh, cross-border elements and we don't have um, isolated markets. These will be increasingly important in having good hydrogen price signals that we can answer some of the questions that were that were put in the agenda, like. Um, you know, will there be a price spread? Well, you need you need reliable hydrogen prices in order for there to be a price spread with anything that, that allows these optimizations. And, and and of course, the other thing that can uh, significantly impact on behaviors in the market um, that we're all uh, discussing and, and uh, awaiting further uh, opportunities to input on is is who pays this? As we see the the, the gas grids having uh, declining gas volumes, and we have a need for investment in pure hydrogen networks when initial throughput will be low. The traditional tariff techniques will not be able to um, to to be relied upon. Um, the other techniques may be necessary, and those in turn will very much influence the spreads between uh, between the different energy vectors that will be required 
in order to make the, the use of the, the, the infrastructure assets more efficient. So here's a, a, a little bit of a, a, a mini shopping list on, on some of the concerns that traders have uh, and some of the opportunities that arise in order to allow markets to do what they're good at, which is respond to these price signals and optimise use of existing capacity that is in the network. And with that, I shall say thank you and hand back to Boyko. Thank you, Doug. I think uh, everyone who had a chance uh, to hear your remarks um, would have enjoyed this visit to reality. It's um, a, a kind of uh, 180, 360 degrees um, horizon of what uh, the issues currently are regarding the hydrogen markets integration. There's obviously quite a lot of uh, road to be covered. Uh, at this point, uh, I would go into into the discussion. There are a couple of uh, comments actually in the chat box which relate uh, to two interrelated issues, and that is uh, the safety of use of hydrogen, in particular at distribution level, and also at the user end. And then, of course, the cost of system conversion, system equipment upgrades, which are needed so to actually reach a, a satisfactory level of, of safety of hydrogen use uh, at DSO and user end level. I would invite uh, for these two uh, comments very briefly if um, Francois or maybe we wish uh, to address them. And then there is one more there, a practical question, which uh, is, is all embracing actually which uh, are the most immediate policies uh, which could be implemented right now to unlock the contribution of hydrogen to transition i think uh, doug if you wish uh, you can you can uh, comment very briefly on that we're running out of time i think francois is locked again uh, could, could the hosts allow him to use his mic? It should be possible now. Yes, thank you. Um, maybe rapidly a few, a few comments on, on, on those questions. Uh, obviously, there is a cost uh, related to, to the conversion of, uh, uh, of, um, of hydrogen, uh, of, of appliances to hydrogen. And this is why, and it was mentioned by Kitty earlier, the, uh, hydrogen is not going to solve all the problems uh, uh, immediately. It's going to take time. And you have to address the sector that are the most likely uh, to find added value into hydrogen. And this is why industry, uh, as feedstock, uh, is, is, the, is, is the main sector where you can find the volumes, where you have some uh, decarbonization pathways from, from uh, market players, and when you can really address uh, some, some value added by converting to hydrogen. For, for households, uh, of course, uh, uh, we trust that it comes in a, in a second uh, phase uh, because indeed uh, there are a number of issues to, to solve. Uh, the leakage into the distribution systems, uh, the, cha the, the conversion of appliances, but it, it goes quite quick. Just to, to, to give you an idea, uh, in, when, when, when we're talking about uh, um, heavy duty mobility, for instance, you see that in trains, in shipping, uh, the, the different market players are already working on this and are already uh, using uh, some, some electric engines to make them compatible with hydrogen. So that, that goes very fast and it will go uh, on, on, on the way. Um, now, uh, on, on, uh, on another topic, uh, which, which, is, uh, uh, which is the regulation, I think what is very important uh, to see now is that uh, you need public support and you need clarity of regulation. And this is on this basis that private sector will take decision to invest. I'm talking about clients, I'm talking about networks, but I'm talking also uh, about uh, production uh, uh, operators. And uh, I joined fully what Duke said, uh, we should differentiate what is in the regulation sector, and probably networks must be, and what is not in the regulation sector, and that's where production should be. 
Thank you. So if I try to summarize the answer, the, the focus should be on what actually works. And well, if, if it doesn't work right now, then, then it could be done later. Uh, Doug, maybe you could address very quickly the last point. Uh, what policies need to be implemented right now so that hydrogen actually works? So I, I guess uh, that's a very simple question, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, yes, um, I, I, I suppose I'd like to agree first with uh, one of the points made by Francois Xavier. Yes, industry first. I think that's the tradition we have had from the uh, from the natural gas industry. We have large point loads which underwrite basic investments, and other things can be can be built on top of that. And I, I foresee that to be happening. So it's important to focus on 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 those areas. But to to enable the market um, is uh, and to ensure a degree of possible convergence in future. So I guess the two things that will introduce that have the potential to introduce significant uncertainties are very different national um, strategies which prevent interaction between national markets, which can have negative effect on, on supply security, energy supply security as well. So an important role for us to keep broadly within the same framework although recognising there will always be a desire for uh, for, for national strategies. Um, I, I think it's going to be one of the, 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 the key things, but but a, a, allowing, it's, it's going to be in the design of the, the products, the design of geos and certificates, the expansion of the ETS, in order to allow um, technology neutral decisions to be made on around optimization and investment. So uh, work work with the market rather than invest, rather than against it, particularly if you're expecting private players to be operating and making those investments rather than policymakers trying to direct technology investments through um, through you know through subsidy and regulation. Um, that would be my my top of my list. Thank you. Well, there's plenty of evidence that, that so without working markets, uh, probably it's very difficult to do anything. So that is, uh, that is uh, obviously a, a valuable comment. Uh, I would hand the floor back to the hosts uh, at the Energy Community Secretary to close this meeting. Thank you very much, Boyko, and thank you very much uh, to all participants and uh, to all speakers of today's session, but also the previous two. So I will just have a couple of thoughts to sum up uh, the, the webinar series, the joint webinar series of ACER and, and, and Energy Community Secretariat. So the timing was perfect for, for, for both ACER and DCS because ACER just finalized back, a background study and white papers, um, whereas the Secretariat is just finalizing the contracting party hydrogen potential study, which of course will be shared on our website in a matter of weeks. Um, I will skip with the, to summarizing what was mentioned on, on, on each of the webinars. I would like to um, guide you to our website in the event section where the, where the slides uh, are available. But of course, we can, we can deduce from all the presentations and the discussions that uh, there is regulatory work, policy work, strategy development work, and most importantly, project work is happening all over Europe, and not only in the European Union, but also in, in the contracting parties, for the time being mostly in Ukraine. And this is, of course, very good news. Um, of course, a lot of questions remain open, and, uh, and we have seen um, the complexity of the energy markets just on the last slide of Doug, which raises a number of questions. On the first panel today, we have, we have, um, we have heard already in-depth discussions uh, with regards to blending and, and the vivid exchange of thoughts, which is also very promising. That was one of the goals of, of this series, and we hope these discussions do continue in the countries themselves, um, which will we will try to facilitate and uh, I can promise you we will not disappear and uh, this discussion uh, will be facilitated further by the Energy Community Secretariat and I'm sure that is the case also uh, for, for ACER. Uh, and with that I would like to thank to the colleagues within ACER, uh, Boyko of Dennis Hesseling, Una Shortho, uh, Ricardo Galletta for the smooth cooperation in bringing this event uh, uh, to its existence. Also, my colleagues Peter Pozgai and, and Ina, who is here um, providing us with, uh, with technical solutions, 
and the hydrogen project team within the Secretariat. Oh, and of course, Christian, uh, the director of PACER, who also joined for, for, for opening, and Janes and Dirk, Janes Kopac and Dirk Bushle from the top management of the Secretariat. And with that, I thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this series, that it was useful, and we hope that this only sparked the discussion and it will uh, continue to become a larger and larger snowball and it can um, uh, just draw itself down to the hydrogen valleys and, 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 and form a bigger discussion in all countries and on a pan-European level as well. Thank you very much.